Hi, and welcome back to a new episode of City of Churches. Today, today we're in Manhattan at St. Vincent Ferrer Church, and I'm here with Father Walter Wagner. Father, thank you so much for inviting us to your church. Anthony, it's a pleasure to have you. There's, this is such a beautiful church, and we're going to get into that in a few minutes, but I understand you're a Dominican friar. That's correct. Could you explain to our viewers about that order? Sure. St. Dominic founded us in 1216 to preach the gospel, but to preach it credibly by first living it. So we Dominican friars live in community. Friar means brother. So we live a brotherly life. Um, we, we share a home, we share times of prayer, we share meals, and we share ministry. And so it's out of that common life that we try to give a witness of the gospel in the way that we preach. And a, a hallmark of it is, of our preaching is that we study. So part of our common living is um, a study particularly of the scriptures. And that hopefully marks the way we do ministry and also the way we build churches. So this church, I think, is a, is a marvel of, marvelous example of that. It's really uh, a theological statement in stone, glass, and wood. When was this church established? Well, the Dominicans came to this part of Manhattan in 1867. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a temporary church. Uh, and then in 1881, we built a, the first permanent church. And then um, uh, it was on this site. And then in 1918, we built this church. So it's basically almost 100, 100 years old. Yeah. So, so it's been three different, well, I would say three different churches to That's finally right. achieve this. Have there been many renovations here? Not too many. Um, you know, we renovated, the, the, the church basically was built in 1918 and then furnished over the next 20, 25 years as the money became available. So the rare dose of the high altar, for example, is from 1933. Okay. Um, at the Second Vatican Council, we renovated by bringing the sanctuary out. Uh, and there were several different versions of that before we reached this version we have. What can you tell us about the design of the sanctuary? The sanctuary, yeah, the sanctuary is really designed for the Dominican order. So the most prominent thing that you would see about our sanctuary that's unusual is the choir stalls. Choir stalls are the side-facing chairs, elaborately carved, in which religious sit to pray. So they, they face each other. So religious life, as, as I mentioned before, is a, a way of living the gospel. So that you're always living an intensely common life. You're always finding your neighbor right in your face. So, when you pray, it's the same. You know, some, sometimes when people pray, they want to just sit, face the cross, face their Jesus. It's fine. But religious sit and look at their neighbor and pray. That, in other words, I'm looking at these guys I live with who drive me nuts sometimes or who surprise me with their gifts sometimes. And this is how I'm finding God, by my common life with them. So when we pray, we sing the psalms back and forth to each other. How is St. Vincent um, represented here in the church? Well, he's in several places. Uh, the, he has a shrine, which is going to be over here. Uh -huh. There's a large statue in the corner here. But he's also in the, in the, in the high altar. Uh, he has, it occupies a prominent place, the painting right above the tabernacle is St. Vincent Ferrer preaching. St. Vincent Ferrer is a Dominican in the classic sense that he's an itinerant preacher. He walked from place to place in um, France and Italy, uh, and originally he's from Spain, but preaching to people. But Vincent also preached significantly about the second coming of Christ. So the window above the high altar has St. Vincent standing before Christ coming in glory, surrounded by the angels of the apocalypse. And because he's a preacher of the second coming, he's also often carrying a trumpet, a marvelous image. So, so the whole window back there is really, but you, if you read the book of Revelation, it all comes alive in our, in our east window. You know, I'm, I'm going to go to the window now because my favorite thing uh, in all the churches that I go to is stained glass. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you catch it on a sunny day, sunny afternoon when the windows when the sun's streaming through the south windows here on this side of us it's just just startling what's your favorite stained glass here well i don't know i think the the east window with the second coming is my favorite that's but they're all very interesting each each stain each window 
uh, has a Dominican saint at the top of it. But around that saint are subsidiary figures and images that, are, that, um, that articulate a type of holiness. So each window represents a different kind of gospel holiness. Uh, so for example, we have up right up above us the window of St. Albert the Great, who was a scholar. And a medieval scholar of great renown, he did two things. One, he was a scripture scholar. So to our right and, and his left is St. John the Evangelist. Okay. Because he studied the Johannine texts. But to our left and his right is the pagan philosopher Aristotle because Albert was also a scientist and he drew on Aristotle's writings to articulate his own view of the world. So the philosopher Aristotle is interesting because he has a green halo. Oh yeah. This is a pagan, you know, but, but nevertheless present because he's recognized as a source of real wisdom, not only for St. Albert, for, but for all of the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas, which came later. And you said that those, that stained glass there is the rosary? That's the rosary window. So the lower part, the lower five, what we call lancets, the mm -hmm. straight up and down parts, are the 15 mysteries of the rosary. Of course, this rosary window was put together before John Paul II gave us the luminous mysteries. And then the upper portion are Dominican saints who popularized the rosary. Oh, wow. It's, it's called the rose, the rose window. It's, an, it's actually beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, I have to bring this up because I'm looking at the architectural design here and I find it absolutely fascinating and beautiful at the same time because I walked around here when I came in and I noticed that the ceiling is composed of brick. Well, they're actually tiles. Tile? They're a version of what's called a Guas Divino tile. Uh huh. So it's a cast concrete compound. Uh, and uh, you'll see them in train stations. Oh. Or anyway, and it's designed to, to muffle the echo. So I mean, it saves money over real stone. That's the other thing. Was Gastavino the, 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 the designer? designer? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. And this, this particular version is called Rumford tile. So the, the pillars of the church are real stone, and the uh -huh. arches are lined in real stone, but the, the body of the walls is in this Rumford stone, and it has the effect of, of making it a great preaching church because the stone is very porous, the, the, sorry, the tiles are very porous and they absorb, they absorb sound. The acoustics is amazing in mm -hmm. here and I noticed that you have two different pipe organs up there. Well actually there's, the, up, up front is one organ, uh -huh. up, up this way, it's just in two different towers. So the pipes oh, are arranged in two towers to reveal the whole rosary window here, the west window. Okay. And then when they put that in and then they, the, what used to be the choir law, is filled with pipes laid flat so that, again, so we can see the whole organ. And then up here is another organ. Oh, wow. So it's a smaller organ for more intimate sound in the, in the sanctuary, for the it, chancel. And they, they're both played from the same console. And so sometimes when Dr. Bainey is playing, they'll sing back and forth to each other. So what style? When I say what style of the architecture design? It would be Gothic. It would be Gothic. The That's 13th what I was century say. Gothic. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the Gothic is the beautiful thing about the Gothic is that, that it, is, it, it is very technically exact, but it also is beautiful. And, and so the technical gift of the Gothic is that you have those vaults up there that are support the ceiling. Mm -hmm. So, what's a, you know, that, the Gloss Divino tiles we spoke of earlier. And the weight of all of that and the roof above it is carried to the ground through these, these shafts. Oh, wow. These stone shafts that go from the ceiling to the ground and all the way through the lower church. And what that allows is that the, the, the vaults transfer the weight to the pillars and it opens up the walls so that you can have the beautiful stained glass windows. Whatever, whatever, he, whatever formula he used causes you to be in both ennobled and made comfortable here. Amazing. Mm -hmm. When and how did you achieve um, landmark status here? Uh, the building was landmarked in the 1990s. The whole complex here is, is landmarked. Now, I, I noticed the, the crucifix above mm -hmm. here. There's one here. That's right. There's one out front. Up front. 
and then above the tabernacle. It's a special kind of crucifix which we usually call the rood. Actually, rood is a, is a, is a medieval English word for cross, uh, R-O-O-D, though so the holy rood is the holy cross. But usually when you say rood, you, you con what, you, what your mind conjures is not only the cross, the crucified Lord, but he's flanked by St. John the Apostle and the Blessed Mother, because it's from the, from the scene where Jesus on the cross gives uh, Mary as mother to the disciple and the disciple as son to Mary. In, in St. John the Evangelist in Brooklyn, where my parents had gotten married, I looked at, I, I gave them photos, and that was up there. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, I don't see it that much anymore. Well, it's a very common feature of medieval churches. And the rood usually would be standing or hanging above the screen that separated the altar from the people. Wow. It's called the rood, it's See, called, called, the, called the rood screen. Now, the Council of Trent did away with those, so we, our church doesn't have a screen, but it has a rood, and beneath it, on the that's called the rood beam, uh -huh. and on the rood beam is a, is a phrase from Galatians, we should glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which we have salvation and resurrection. But our, our route is also unusual because in addition to having Mary, the Blessed Mother, and St. John, it has the two thieves. So there's the two, the two yes. thieves on their crosses. So, but when you come into the church, the route is present. And it's here at the entrance to the sanctuary, and then it's present again in gold above the tabernacle. All, all these kinds of details are planned out. It amazes me how much work, like you just said, how much work and detail mm -hmm. goes into this. It's not just thrown together. It's oh, a, no. It's not random at all. It's no. all a plan. The, the, the stations of the cross are very unique here. They Can are. Can you tell us? Well, they're, about they're designed to look like they were bought over time. They're not, they don't match. So, so in other words, the, the what would be interesting because the, the friend that the, 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 the stations of the cross were popularized by Franciscans. So, so our church would look like it acquired the stations over time as they became popular among people. And so, if you there's a variety of styles and they're hung in all kinds of interesting places. You'll see them above archways and, um, yeah. It's it's they're, they're very unique. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you mentioned that there was a statue of St. Vincent here. Um, what about any other statues you'd like to tell our viewers? About, well, um, I would say the other statues of interest are by a Dominican sculptor named Thomas McGlynn. We have a wonderful image of Our Lady of Fatima right over here. That's by Thomas McGlynn. And then uh, we have a beautiful statue of St. Martin de Porres back in uh, St. St. Patrick's Chapel. And then we have a copy of uh, Michelangelo's Pietà right over here, Lady of Sorrows. So those probably are the no notable pieces of statuary. And oh, I should say, the most obvious one, here is Our Lady. This is an alabaster statue of Our Lady Gate of Heaven. Oh, wow. And you notice that she's situated at the entrance to the sanctuary. Yes. So uh, the, the entrance would be the, the high altar would be the symbol of heaven. And so Mary is the way, is the way to heaven. And you see the shield under her is a golden road leading to a golden gate. And as, as I say, not only that it's a, that, it, that the statues are there and that they're skillfully rendered, but that they're arranged in some kind of coherent way. That it was, like you were saying before, that it was, was planned mm -hmm. and, and as a reason for everything. So I noticed that there's a bell by St. Vincent's. Can you explain that to us? Sure, it's called the Miracle Bell. And the idea was that if you received, you, if you prayed to St. Vincent for help and you, your prayers were answered, you would come and ring the bell. And people still do. Oh, that's, that's... We're in here praying, we're in here saying our prayers, and all of a sudden you hear the bell ring. So that means that prayers were answered. Yeah, it's what they do. That's right. And people, and this, that's, I think another beautiful thing about this church is that, and it's providential, is its location. It's at a major intersection. It's near two major subway lines. And so people from all over the city come here and pray. And because it's open all day long, it's, it's a place where people can sort of be in their corner. How, how many people, I know you mentioned it before, but how many people can you sit in here? I would say now about 800. Wow. On the one hand, it's a very grand church. It seats hundreds of people. It's very majestic in its proportions. But you also find that it's an intimate church, and you can feel comfortable in here by yourself. 
you can go into a corner and feel like you are in one of the most small village churches somewhere else. How has the neighborhood changed, so to speak, is when the church was first established? Sure. Well, when you, as you say, when the church was built, this would have been um, to the east, a working class neighborhood, mm -hmm. and to the west, toward the park, a more professional class neighborhood. Um, and, and we had still had the elevated railways on 3rd Avenue and 2nd Avenue. So um, there were lots of, lots of walk-up tenements packed with people. So when this church was built, it had 3,000 families attached. Wow. And there was a lower church, so you had masses on the half hour and people packed in. We uh, have now got a large number of Hispanic people who pray here and a large number of Filipino people who pray here. And so they have great devotion to Our Lady of Guadalupe. So we're developing a shrine to Our Lady of Guadalupe. So on the one side is uh, St. Joseph's altar, which is from 1918, and it's part of our ancient heritage of the friars. Uh, we're under the patronage of St. Joseph, and then opposite is Our Lady of Guadalupe, who represents uh, a, a transformation in the demography of the parish. We represent it primarily by being welcoming. The doors are open, and the beautiful thing is you can come and you pick your own place to pray. So the, the nice thing is, with a church like this, that the individual spiritualities can be accommodated within the framework of the whole. When we come back, Father Wagner is going to show us his favorite artifact here in the church. Okay, sure. So Happy stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to City of Churches, and here I am with Father Wagner, who's going to tell us something very unique about St. Vincent's. Terrific. We're actually standing at the Rosary Altar. Now, each of the side altars of the church has a different style and is directed to a purpose. So in this case, this is uh, Our Lady's Altar in the church. In Dominican spirituality, Our Lady is connected intimately with the Rosary. So in the, at the heart of the uh, Reredos here is Our Lady giving St. Dominic the rosary. Oh, wow. and, uh, and then beneath that is this uh, dog here carrying yeah. a torch in his mouth. Now that comes from a legend that St. Dominic's mother, when she was pregnant with him, had a vision of a hound carrying a torch. It's a play, really, on the name of the order. Dominicanes, where the Dominicans, Dominicanes would also mean in Latin, the dogs of God. Oh. So we go around the world uh, faithfully and loudly proclaiming the truth, which is the light, the torch in the mouth there. Beneath the um, image here of the rosary is what we call the docile of the altar, and it features Pope St. Pius V, who was a Dominican, and he's sitting here in the Vatican praying. Oh, yes. And he's praying for the Christian fleet battling the Turks in the Battle of Lepanto. And it was a famous time when the Pope asked people to pray and use the rosary to, to pray for the, for the Christians who ended up winning the battle. And on this side, you have a friar preaching the rosary to people. In the middle of the docile and on the tabernacle, you have the image of a pelican. I see that, yes. Uh -huh. Who feeds, according to legend, the pelican feeds its young with its blood. So it's an image of the Lord who gives himself to us in the Eucharist. So that's why it's on top of this tabernacle. And this tabernacle sits here because this altar was designed to be the repository for Holy Thursday. Um, and further, the altar is bluish marble. Our Lady's color is usually blue, so you can see it in the stone. And then over here is the, what we call the Easter Sepulchre. And traditionally in English churches, English medieval churches, in the north wall of the church, there is a tomb like this 
And it was used uh, during Easter time because on Good Friday, they would uh, put the host in a shroud and bury it. And then on Easter Sunday, they would resurrect it with a big solemn procession. Now this uh, tomb was put in because our architect Bertram Goodhue loved English things. And so he put that in. We don't use it in the way the medievals did, but we do pray here on the night of Good Friday, keeping watch with uh, the Lord in his, as he goes through, as he lies in the tomb. So, Father, that, that uh, there's a lot of history here. Yeah, there is. And a lot of great things that, yeah. that you shared with us. And I, I just want to thank you My pleasure so entirely. much for very inviting glad to here. us yeah. at City of Churches very to glad. come here in a film. And I want to just say to all our viewers, I, I hope you enjoyed this episode of City of Churches at St. Vincent Ferrer. And uh, if you have any questions about this church or any other church, please, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Or you can write into us at 1712 10th Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11215. Until next time, I'm Anthony Mangano. We are with Father Wagner. Pleasure. I want to thank you all so much for watching our show. Catch our next episode. See you real soon. God bless you. Thank you so much.